in, in parabolic flight, so she's going to talk more about her projects. Um, I thought what I'd do is talk a little bit about the lead up to my participation in a zero gravity flight, which was uh, in 2001. Um, a little bit about what led to my interest in wanting to absolutely make sure I was on that flight, whatever. Um, and then uh, how that's influenced subsequent work. I'll just talk a little bit briefly about uh, the sort of outcomes, as it were. Um, this is a very grainy, tiny little picture, but it sort of suits the subject matter. It's quite a furtive shot. Um, I took inside um, a laboratory at the let me get this right the Aerospace Medical Research Unit lab at McGill University in Montreal in late 1994, and that's really where my, my interest started. I was living in Canada at the time, and very very interested in medical experimentation and the idea of what happens to the body in the laboratory spaces and the idea of the data body, what gets left behind, the performative role of the subject in medical research. Uh, the, the relationship between the subject and the experiment, all these sorts of questions were swirling around. Um, and I found that I could get first-hand data by going into laboratories and taking part in medical experiments and get paid for it. So it was a sort of winner all round. Um, and also in Canada, I think there was, there was, it was in some ways easier to, to participate as a female. Um, as, as sort of, uh, there's problems that there might be in, in other countries at the time. These were all education research institutes, they weren't private job testing companies, however. Um, and yes, yeah, so I found myself in, in this laboratory. I, I can't quite remember what, what spurred me to want to investigate aerospace medicine. Um, but I found, I found myself there at the, at the top of this, this panoptic network of, of, of buildings, the top of Drummond Street. Um, and the first, thing, the first, I suppose, the first thing I came across in terms of zero gravity were the photographs that lined the wall of this um, network of offices, and they were these really quite beautiful photographs, quite stoic, almost beatific portraits of people in zero gravity. Um, unfortunately, I can't find the one that I absolutely clung on to, but there was something almost quite transcendent about the look on this um, astronaut's <coughs> face. Uh, it was kind of religious imagery of, of, of him being represented absolutely filling the frame with this, this look on his face. And it, I suppose it was my interest um, kind of started off from that point. Um, although I was to find out that actually the work that was being done there uh, was, 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 was far from beatific or transcendent in any shape or form. Um, just look at the, the yellow, um, uh, what would you call that, oil drum. That's uh, What was really nice about this laboratory was it was all very, very low tech. It was about investigating motion sickness in terms of medis uh, medical aerospace. Um, the, sub the experiment that I took part in was subsequently uh, reworked and performed on one of the space shuttle missions using the same equipment, so there was a, there was a really nice linkage there. But what took place in the, in the laboratory was, was, was incredibly um, uh, string and uh, sticky tape. Experimenter, leave the room. Watson calibration. EOG calibration. Eyes on target. The role of vision and neck inputs during adaptation to motion sickness. I was one of six subjects, and I spent a week in the dark, in complete darkness, um, performing what were called provocative, self-generated movements intended to provoke nausea. So it wasn't wasn't the, the best week I've spent. Um, but it was, it was basically it was looking at how the body adapts to motion sickness. The idea was if you performed 
uh, the, I also got these, this was the very first time I did it, all, it all went a bit pear-shaped, um, I got the choreography a little bit wrong, so I don't know whether my data was, was binned at the end of it, <clears throat> but it was, it was looking at how the body, essentially how, how, how it adapts, um, just read a little bit about it, uh, and I had to verbally rate my nausea on a scale from 1 to 10. I had and body movements were electronically monitored with sticky electrodes during the prescribed provocative self-generated movements intended to provoke nausea with 30 minutes of torso rotation. A neck brace was also used so as to see the effects of complete neck immobilization on gaze control. And then I was allowed to take home this grainy black and white video footage and I became quite fascinated by the footage itself in, 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 using it within a, within a, a participatory installation. Um, I was quite interested in the way that, it's, way that it looked. It's very un, this very awkward, undisciplined performance. And I suppose up to that point, my interest in going into this laboratory was, was motivated by this, what I saw as this exciting, libidinal, techno-scientific world of um, medical aerospace, rather than actually just standing in an oil drum trying to, trying to make myself ill. And, and the idea that this gender and age became uh, Always indistinct. Being female in this environment seems quite irrelevant, but also incongruous. Um, and anyway, I made a piece in which the, the subject inadvertently, the, the viewer to the installation, viewing this footage inadvertently, starts mimicking and miming along to, to the installation, to the footage itself. Um, and then, as I said, it was it was then um, two years after my participation, um, June 1996, on mission STS-78, Space Shuttle Columbia, experiment E410, TRE, the torso rotation experiment, was performed by the crew. Um, this investigation was measuring how the vestibular apparatus, or inner ear, adapts to the weightless environment, and incorporated the same computers, the microcomputers worn on the head and the back. Uh, I don't think, I think they got away without the neck brace, so they're quite lucky. Um, and it was interesting watching the post-flight conference, I managed to get the video from NASA of the scientists, uh, of the astronauts performing this experiment, um, where they, they describe it as performing this, a strange looking dance, important to calibrate the equipment. So I was quite interested in, in, the, in the terminology, the language that swirls around uh, in, in this realm. But I think what, the, the thing I wanted to do was kind of dredging up, and it just does feel a little bit like an archaeological exercise, actually, because the, the flight was some time, quite some time ago, and this was quite some time before that, um, but was a, an interest which prevailed, which was about the idea of the accident. Um, at the time, I was very interested in, in the writings of Paul Virilio and his concept of the museum of the accident, that when um, a, tech, a piece of technology is created or invented, inherently the ac an accident is created as well when you invent the train, you invented the train crash, uh, the plane, the plane crash, and so on. And he posits that there should be a museum of accidents to, to, to uh, mark these sort of inverse um, uh, pr pr productions or, or, or uh, creations. Um, but I was interested in um, where, where the human subject fits into, into that model of, of, of the accident, seeing as that we haven't really caught up with our with our with our speeds of development, we haven't really caught up with the, um, the vehicles that we produced to move us from A to B, and what, what that might mean. Um, actually, I'm just going to read this quick quote I, re I really like from J.G. Ballard in uh, from Atrocity Exhibition, where he wonders whether space travel is inevitably doomed because it recapitulates primitive stages in the growth of our nervous systems before the development of our sense of balance and upright posture a forced return to infantile dependency. Very interesting. This this, this uh, notion of almost a, a showing up the regression of, of, of the human in, in these environments. Uh, the other thing I just want to kind of keep is that idea of this, of, this, of sound that prevails in these environments. That that the, the beeping. Um, I'm, I wasn't producing it. It was I was having to move in time with the beep. So it became almost quite Pavlovian hearing that beep and having to keep up this this uh, choreography over over that period of time. So I'm going to talk about um, the, the Star City uh, project now. Um, it was basically, I suppose my project was in, in two parts. Uh, this one really, really took over actually, more than the um, project that I'd actually applied for, which was to continue looking at motion sickness, which, which I did, and in, in a sense that's, that's sort of taken off in different directions. But I had asked if there was any possibility, and this was completely ignorant and absurd, whether it was possible to go on board one of the parabolic flights with an ultrasound machine and scan uh, somebody's um, belly 
um, in order to document the movement of organs inside the body. Um, I'm not a medical trained person, I don't know what I was thinking, and that was, that was sort of knocked on the head, but it, I still think there is a project in there somewhere. Um, but it, it meant that I was then put in touch with Anthony Bull, uh, you might have seen in the video, um, from Imperial College. And I ended up becoming recruited as one of his subjects, um, which took roughly about half the, the, the parameters being a, a subject for him. Um, he had these wonderful terminologies um, applied to the subjects of being untrained, naive subjects, and um, trained naive subjects. Uh, and I was a, definitely an untrained and naive subject, because a, 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 a trained and naive subject was more Ad Whitman, um, seen footage of already, the dancer, an aerial performer who has incredible um, awareness, haptic awareness and, and a control of her, over her body, uh, whereas I, I didn't, I don't. So it all went a bit wrong, not on this parabola. Um, I'll just read a little bit about what um, Anthony was actually looking at. Um, he's a bioengineering, or he was a bioengineering, moved somewhere else now, researcher at Imperial College. And he was interested in, in wanting to address two questions, spinal control as a response to gravity and movement control in the absence of gravity. And he basically came up with these various tasks uh, that we were asked to, to do over, over, over the parabolas. Um, I think Kevin gave a really nice insight into, into this sort of crazy, frenetic, slightly chaotic um, situation of, of setting things up and um, responding to the situation, what was possible, what wasn't. Um, and there were, we weren't really allowed to, or Anthony wasn't really allowed to bring any, any equipment. So the only way to immobilize subjects was just a bit of packing tape along the bottom of the, of the plane. I think he had lots of very sophisticated ideas about how the subjects could be tethered, but it just came down to, to a bit of tape, which I, I quite appreciate. So I sort of use a lot of gaffer tape where possible. Uh, and then we were invited to perform these, these, these uh, roles. I'm just going to read actually what, um, I'm listening back on an interview with Anthony, I think he puts it really nicely what he, what he was looking at in, in this work. Um, the study is related to a neurophysiological study looking effectively at how the brain controls the muscles of the extremities and the muscles of the spine, and in particular arm muscles, and the controlling muscles of the spine on the other side of the arm that's moving. A straightforward understanding of the physics is when you lift an arm out sideways or forwards, your body will tend to tip over that way due to gravity pulling on your arm because your centre of mass has shifted. So your back muscles will contract on the other side and stretching up a little bit so you don't fall over. When you do neurophysiological ex experiments, you see these muscles are closely linked. The question is, are they closely linked due to gravity? I pull my arm out, my body senses gravity, I contract the other side on the back. Or are they closely linked because the body has physically connected them in some way? The brain has physically connected these muscles. When you do one thing, the other thing happens automatically. So he was asking, do people who have been trained in a certain way, who are unusual, dancers or others, do they have a different control of these muscles together? Uh, are they physically hardwired or are they separated? Experiments on Earth suggest they are different, but they can't say categorically because they're still sensing gravity. So if we take gravity away, uh, are the, uh, if these things are connected, then we can know it's not because they're sensing gravity. So these were the sorts of questions that um, that uh, Anthony was up, was asking over the, over the, the, the course of the parabola. Um, I interviewed him about a month later, and I think there was a, a, a slight sense that of perhaps the results wouldn't, um, that this flight in itself wouldn't, wouldn't yield all the answers to, to those questions. I think there wasn't a complete absence of gravity. He said there was a, it was 0.05 gravity in the plane, but there was still very much an awareness of up and down and, and so on, so that, that that couldn't be ruled out, but it was still yielding some very, very interesting results. For my part, I became fascinated with, with this inadvertent experiment, um, where, which is the very first parabola when my feet came out of these rather ludicrous restraints and I fell upwards and hit my head on the ceiling of the plane. Which was, it was, it was just as an aside, it's very funny that the word that kept cropping up that week was jolly, or you're on a jolly. Um, and I, I don't think any of us thought of this experience as a, as a, as a jolly. It was quite serious and uh, 
substantially in different ways. So um, to cut a long story short, in, in the sense that that, the, that idea of the accident um, followed through with this piece and it became embedded within a, within a text and within a presentation that three of us did about a year after where we were sort of picking up on, on our individual input, impetuses and um, motivations for doing this, this piece and this, or doing this experiment in the first place. Okay, I'm going to whiz, whiz on very, very quickly. Um, actually, this, I want to just kind of quite do a couple of quotations because um, uh, Eddie George is, is not here, very sadly. So I just thought I might quote from a couple of. Uh, I, I had conducted a, a, an interview. What I did with the motion sickness side of it was I interviewed a number of people. I gave some questionnaires out and interviewed people pre and post flight. And I was interested in things such as flashbacks that people might have. Kind of, how the dreams, how dreams might be changing, experiences of emotional sickness. So it's looking at sort of physical and emotional responses to the situation, um, and uh, got some really beautiful and very surprising responses from from, from Anna and, and from Eddie particularly, which I, which I I found really insightful. So I'm just going to read um, some from from Eddie because he's he's not here. Um, uh, for him, it's this realization that you do have organs that the experience of zero gravity reminded him when, when he was hungry. Um, the shock, being reminded of the body in such a different way, the body has not responded to anything like that before. It's a new experience. He had the fleeting thought of something that someone said. It's like being born close to an amniotic state. Um, but thinking about this and smacking his head on the ceiling killed that idea. You go from fancy thinking to a Homer Simpson moment. Your body lets you down. It brings it home that your body is doing something it hasn't done before or experienced and you don't have the control you normally would. It's potentially frightening, but it's a controlled environment and you feel like a lab rat. The other thing that's interesting, forget the number of parabolas um, that curse you, all, all the tropes and metaphors of flight don't figure, they don't apply, but what does this sense of joy, wonderment, it's almost childlike, the joy of having gone beyond a boundary. You're literally in the space that a musician occupies when they're playing something far out. You've given gravity the slip. It's in the space of music, dance, and the language of musicians, how they metaphor metaphorize what they do. Uh, and a couple of interesting things, I think, to, to, also to, to quote from. I thought I wanted to proselytize about it. If you've had an experience only a few people have had, there's something that's untranslatable. It's not like falling in love. If you haven't been there, you don't know what it's like. The futility to try and explain something gets rubbed away, trying to explain it. The physical, the joy, didn't feel nauseous at all uh, for him. And then he, he goes off on another interesting aside where he quotes Deleuze, um, uh, interior, interiority was not all that, but a life lived without interiority is uh, more about joy and states of becoming. Um, and zero G is like that, it doesn't leave room or time for interiority. The body is doing the work. You're going along with what I'm going along with what my body is experiencing, like being in a car crash. That's where it separates from dreams because you're very, very present. And I thought that was a really nice summation. It's, it wasn't uh, it's, this kind of brute force idea that Nicola mentioned is, is, is very true. You're absolutely in that in that moment, um, and it's it's it's, there's something almost quite animal, I think, about that state. Um, just quickly, and these two, very, very briefly, on these, uh, these two pieces of work that I made subsequently, and I think sometimes pieces of work take a long time to, to come out, or ideas from, from an experience. And um, Kevin talked about the fact, you know, you can't see out the windows, you don't know where you, where you are. You, um, and I was very interested by that, and I felt very annoyed myself that I hadn't looked out of the window at that point. So about two years later, very fortuitously, had the chance to um, having met somebody in an aero club bar who had an acrobatics, aerobatics plane rather, the opportunity to go into um, the sky above, above Northumbria and loop the loop on a, on a few occasions, and became very interested in in that um, that so that that sense of space. This is called the Aresti cryptographic system. This is by which aerobatic pilots define airspace and will choreograph the manoeuvres within that space. It's very interesting in just the, the graphic, the notational side of what that involves. And then um, made a, a piece of work that was for an Arts Catalyst event, First Artists Air Show at Farnborough in 2004 and did repeated um, 
looped, loop in the loop over Northumbria um, and video this from certain viewpoints, the view directly out of the window, a camera fixed back looking at myself and the pilot and the view down the plane, uh, the, the wing of the, the plane which, which this is. Um, I think what's very significant was, um, and has been talked about, was, was the sensation of 2G. I think everyone was, well not everyone, but so my, I was very fixated on the idea of zero gravity, but to, to the double gravity became, became quite significant to, to consider. Um, this, this experience put me back into that state of being aware of, of gravity, but what, what happened in this, which was very different, being, you're pinned, you're sitting, seated obviously, you're pinned back in your seat, and there's nothing you can do but just look at this viewpoint that you really shouldn't be looking at. Um, <laughs> Similarly, there's an audit, audible cue of, of, of the plane making the sound, saying that the plane should not be in this situation either. <laughs> and then, just very briefly, I want to just end with uh, another piece um, which, which came out of, that, out of that experience, which was a fascination with these, these particular environments and the, the psychology of people who work in those sorts of extreme environments, like, like astronauts and cosmonauts. Um, and in 2007 um, made a project which entailed going onto a nuclear submarine and interviewing or a couple of submarines and interviewing people. These were, these were docked, these weren't at, um, at sea, but talking to the very peculiar, um, odd, fascinating people who work on, on submarines. This is the sound room of a, of a submarine. This is where all the, the array of hydrophones and, and, and so on, a uh, thousand hydrophones, the, this signal comes into this, this room and it becomes both an audible signal but also a visual signal on that, on that screen so that the persons, people sitting in that room all day will sit there with headphones, will monitor everything that's in that vicinity. Um, and speaking, not wasn't this chap, but another one who was talking about how this, this impinged on every aspect of his waking life, this very stra uh, strange um, sensory um, job that he does, that he, for example, whenever he watches a film, he doesn't really listen to, to, the, to the voice or anything which is in the foreground, he's constantly listening to the background sound within a film because that's, it continues on from the, from, from, from the day job. Uh, also the sign, the, the, the kind of pressures of the work environment, um, there's a number of people who, well, it's quite common apparently for submariners to have dreams about being um, buried alive and dreaming of being in coffins, that's quite a common experience. Um, often, you know, being submerged at months of time, having to take vitamin supplements because of the lack of, of sunshine and so on. So this is, this is very much still work in progress, and the idea is to make some sort of radio broadcast with this material at some stage, but I did do one little piece which was um, working with some of the sounds from the archive, and both sounds that I recorded, um, and doing a, a sub-aqua installation um, where sounds from the Southern Mariner's archive was, was placed in a swimming pool. So mixing the macro and the micro, as it were, there was sounds of um, kind of tiny, tiny limpet and hermit life mixed up with um, uh, other more menacing um, sounds from, from the military. But I think I've gone on for too, too long, so I'm going to just stop it there. Sorry? No, that's it. <laughs> it's only a tiny, tiny sip. It's on the website. It's a, it was a piece called Contest Behaviour. It was at um, Tinside Lido in Plymouth. And it was obviously interesting because it's a, a seawater pool that goes out into Plymouth Sound. So you get military sound. Yeah, we have some time for questions yeah. and answers. So, who's the first over there? Hello. Fine. <laughs> uh, both you and the speaker before you said something about um, people, especially underwater, being odd and 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 so on. And you mentioned about the dreams and so on. But what is it? Why? I mean. Obviously, you have two very different perspectives uh, looking at these people. What is it that makes them odd to you? Which, which people are odd? Sorry. Well, you mentioned the people on the submarines, for example, that uh, both of you described, uh, like, for example, the, the speaker before you said um, the people that are submarines are really odd, and then they just describe what they do as they work. 
but what is it that makes you describe them as odd, odd people? I think it's just a dis decision to, to live a life like that, which is an incredibly, um, what I would see as quite unpleasant, uh, cramped, claustrophobic conditions, cut off from friends and family for months at a time. There's lots of pressures, there's a very clear hierarchy there that's, that's keeping them, people in, in a particular position. Um, very little kind of sensory pleasure, I'd say, in, in an environment like that. Um, I mean, they, they talk about themselves as the silent service and, and talk about themselves as having a very different psychology from, from, from people in the other services because it attra you know, attracts a certain sort of person who, who is able to, to live in that way and to kind of keep their emotions and, in, in check. And, um, you know, things like that. You know, it, it, for example, one thing that quite shocked me is if, for example, if a family member dies and is very sick, they, they can't necessarily be told that. Because the news of that could be quite uh, traumatic, because they can't, you know, they might not be able to leave leave the vessel for quite some time. So it's it's really is this own, their, their own their own little world and how they how they make sense of it and how they negotiate it. So I was quite interested in that. I was also quite interested in my have the fact they were quite ready. People I spoke to were quite ready to talk about those aspects. Um, did Did you ask, or did they say why they chose to do what they do? Um, I think there's, there's a lot of jobs which, which you know, it just feels right. For example, years ago I interviewed people who worked in a, in a mortuary and, and performed autopsies. And I think it's, you know, there's these certain jobs which are jobs for life, you know. <laughs> Once you recruit for that, you probably won't end up doing anything, anything else. It just, there's just something that clicks in, into, into place. But I, I suppose it's quite a strong, perhaps a stronger camaraderie amongst those, those people. Maybe they, they're drawn towards that quite controlled environment for, for other sorts of reasons. Um, but uh, no, I, I'd, I'd be curious to go back and, and find out more. Thank you. Yeah. Question over here. Thanks. That was freaky and trippy in all sorts of ways. I just wondered, can you tell us about the week that you spent in the dark? What kind of um, works did that promote um, maybe afterwards, or did you keep a diary? And also, would you talk about the inner workings of the inner ear? in microgravity if you can. Pick oh, up okay. I, sorry, I don't think I know. I'm equipped to really talk about the, the inner ear. I mean, I think that I've, what I found actually going to a lot of different laboratories over the years is you start to pick up the words and the vernacular quite quickly and nod and make it look as though you understand exactly what's going on. But I only had a very basic knowledge of, of the vestibular system and what was, what was happening. Um, and it was quite a long time ago, so I don't think I could do that justice. But, but um, it, was, it was, I suppose, it, it wasn't every day all day in, in the dark. I think the experiment took about two, an hour and a half, two hours, a lot, a lot of which was just sitting in the dark initially, adapting to the dark, so it was about half an hour, which was really nice actually because it just meant myself and the experimenter had, had time to have a chat and roam around all sorts of, of different questions. And then um, climb into the oil drum, get my sort of <laughs> neck brace on, computer on, and, and then do the, do the experiments. And then sort of an hour and a half later, sort of stumble out the drum and, and walk home. So it was, uh, sorry, that's, that's not a very good answer, is it really? What, what exactly were you wanting to, to get at? What did it make you realise about yourself? Did you produce any artwork on Oh yeah, sorry, yes, I made, I made a couple of pieces. Um, one was called Abulia, and it was an installation. Um, I suppose it, it more widely, looked at the area of experimentation. For example, I took part in another study looking at um, visual system um, and it involved staring in the dark, looking at a big screen locked into this mechanism. And I discovered after about a week there was a monkey in the room next door doing the same thing, which was uh, quite interesting. So I became quite fascinated by the, the, the people who, the, the, the role of the animal. The, the animal was a surrogate human, I suppose, in those environments. I mean, it was a monkey because he had no choice. It was a much more invasive experiment. They, you know, put electrodes into its brain to, to map neural movements. And I felt deeply uncomfortable about it. But it was an opportunity to talk to those experimenters and, and sort of dig beneath the surface a little bit about how they felt about their study and their relationship with the animal. I mean, one of the scientists said that he had a psychic relationship with the monkey and he thought that the monkey forgave him. I thought that was very interesting. It's not something you would expect a scientist to say, really. Um, 
So I think being in those environments just hanging out, it gives you the opportunity to that people go off guard and you can get under the surface. So a lot of the times in that work, I would interview people, and the, and the you know the the interviews would be part of the work. There'd be you know a kind of archive of material that, that people could refer to. But um, it it basically took the form of a video piece where you would it, the, the image jumps between different monitors. So in order to see it, you would have to sort of do the same motion that the person that I, I was doing on the screen and then went other sides to it. And then when I did it again, that was in Canada, I did in Hull, I managed to get the footage from the NASA astronaut doing the same thing, so it, it just took it somewhere else. Yeah, I was also interested in oh, the experience that you had in, um, in the dark. So were you there for a week, non-stop, 24 hours? Oh, no, 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 not 24 hours. It's only, okay. uh, I'm sorry, I've made it sound much more exciting. It was only about an hour and a half, two hours a day. So it was just every day. It was just looking at how the body adapts, um, you know, to, to those self-generated movements over, over, but it had to be in consecutive days, you know, in order to do that. So, um, yeah, sorry. Lots of hardcore. So you were subject in when you actually went up into microgravity. Did you do any of your own work up there, or was it more being a participant in another artist's work? Um, well, it was both. My my, my, um, my I suppose my work was um, although it became much more that I wanted to work with Anthony and, and work with the, the data that he got, but it was essentially initially getting all these questionnaires together, interviewing people um, and getting some video material um, together as well. So, and then subsequently about a month, two months later, I went I had a little residency at the Air and Space Museum in Washington and, and sort of followed up there. But that was really more about compiling an archive, so I spent a, a few weeks uh, in the history of NASA history office just trying to find as much as I could about space medicine in in the states, oral histories, and, and so on, and, and creating this huge archive. But it's I, no, I mean, it only really became a text piece, to be honest, it, um, and a series of presentations. So it, it didn't sort of become a video piece or anything like that, which I thought it might have done initially. But I think it, it, I, be, I became more, more sidestepped really by Anthony's experiment and what and what that was, and we, you know, we've, we've sort of followed that up subsequently. Anyone else? Um, I was very interested when you talk about the dream and how the experience reminds you of the dream. My question is, I have a quite lucid dream, and so when I fell over, I really feel like I'm falling somewhere. So initial question is, did you feel that you can collect from your memory of dreaming that the sensation of your dream was similar to what you experienced on that zero gravity. And the second question is, did you ever dream about that sequence afterwards in the dream, that but having the same sort of sensation in your dream so that your body remembers? Yes, I mean, I think a lot of people have been said that it's, it's not this Kind of wonderful floating sensation, which might be what you might experience in a in a in a dream. Maybe I don't know. Um, you know, it is about it's about falling, falling upwards. So that was my perception of it. It's this brute force thing. It's the equivalent of the time it reminded me of that sensation. Not so much of dr uh, flying dreams, but that sensation when you drive over a humpback bridge and everything moves up and you feel very sick. But it, it, that stretched out over thirty seconds was 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 that perception. Um, so very different from flying, but a few people did report that it reminded them of flying dreams as well. So there was there was a, you know it was kind of interesting. Um, both 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 Eddie and Anna particularly talked to, you know talked about the experience of, of dreaming and of flying dreams and having that and that being being reminded of that. Um, and I did, yeah, I did have subsequent dreams. I think what was very interesting was that quite a few people reported flashbacks. Um, Quite soon after the flight as well, um, you know, strange sort of thing, feeling of just being move, moving up, just coming out of the blue at particular moments. But that seemed to be quite short-lived. It didn't seem to last more than a few days afterwards. Um, and that we had quite a rocky flight back. It was, it was incredibly horrendous turbulence on, on the flight back. And I think it was that was sort of interesting that they, that, that the kind of flashbacks. I think for a few people kicked in there, and as well at that point.
last question. I've been similarly really intrigued by the idea of, of darkness and contained spaces. So um, I've done a project with a true driver here on Northern Line in London. Um, and I'm just saying that I've spent, um, I did a project with a tube driver on my Northern Line because he spends, you know, pretty much his whole eight hours in the dark. And then I, and then I did an interview with uh, one of the Mars 500 um, uh, subjects. Uh, they spent 520 days. Uh -huh in the capsule, mm -hmm. which is a test for the duration of flight for Mars. Mm -hmm. And so my question was, um, one of them told me that basically when he got out, the first thing he wanted to do is just go, go on a ride, sort of offset the fact that he couldn't get any other movement and just like shuffle around the little capsule. Mm -hmm. um, what, was, what was like the submarine uh, people, what, what they wanted to do after they got off their shift? Or, Oh, what was it for, like, like for you? Because if you were contained, like a form. Oh, I was only on there for about oh. an hour or two hours at, at the most, and it was, certainly wasn't submerged. It was just, you know, it was just sitting at in Devonport, in Devonport. So um, I don't know. I, I didn't get, I didn't get to that 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 stage of really asking what they they do. Um, I'm like, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think it impacts on the on another note. I think lots of them have. It's difficult. They find it hard to sustain relationships and also kind of broken relationships because, but that might be to do with more, you know, being away from for that those periods of time. But, um, but in terms of what they, they actually physically do, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't know. It just seems like there's a there's a response on a lot of levels like to if you do something different than yes. what your body sort of made for. Yes. Yes. Um, it's conscious or conscious. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a good question.